Thank you very much for your questions. Uh, we had a lot of very good questions regarding the first part and the definitions of neuroplasticity and also nociceptive pain, which uh, uh, when we talk about complex pain syndrome, we talk about nociceptive pain, neuropathic pain, and inflammatory pain. Now, in the second part, uh, we're going to continue with a little bit of the neuroscience, neurobiology, as well as the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of a drug. Now, I was assured that no one in the audience ever used marijuana. But if you did, it works, okay? It works. And this is the basic science of cannabis and, cannab and tetrahydrocannabinol and cannabinoids because we do know now that there is a cannabinoid receptor, cannabinoid 1. And this cannabinoid 1, very much like the mu and the kappa and the delta receptor and the N-methyl D-aspartate ion complex receptor, are affected. So therefore, the tetrahydrocannabinol, whether you smoked it or sniffed it or ate it in a brownie, okay, uh, works because it works on this cannabinoid effect. And it actually, we found by taking care of patients then with AIDS in the late 80s and 90s, that it relieves pain, it improves appetite, uh, and uh, it really helps in the weight loss process. So uh, because of the wasting syndrome that occurs with a lot of these chronic diseases like AIDS, but also like neurogenitive disorders, heart disease, and pulmonary disease. So it does pr also provide a complementary effect on endogenous opioids. So, so beta endorphins and dienorphins and encephalins are also affected. There's also a non-receptor, anti-inflammatory, immunomodulator type of receptor that is also affected by tetrahydrocannabinol. And it affects a certain receptor called, the two, uh, it inhibits a certain substance called tumor necrosis factor alpha-2A. So subsequently, we see this very commonly in, in a lot of the inflammatory disease, and we'll talk about those cytokinings once again, as I mentioned, on a third part. But it, it, these, these types of substances are the ones that actually exacerbate the inflammatory process and actually destroys. Inflammation in the body, it, uh, the body immediately sends all of its soldiers out there to get rid of this inflammation. And it can't differentiate between the bad cells and the good cells. We see that in cancer. So it just destroys everything along the way. So mediating those inflammatory factor, the factors are pivotal in re, re, not only to manage pain, but to also help in the, in the management of chronic diseases. Endocannabinoids, synthetic cannabinoids, and phytocannabinoids are the ones that we have available. Endocannabinoids, we have these endocannabinoids in our body. And it sometimes is that you go and get tested, and all of a sudden you test positive for endocannabinoids because we make these substances in our body. So subsequently, we can test positive. It doesn't happen very often, but it can. Then we have the synthetic cannabinoids, which is really the hallmark of that particular drug is Marinol. We used it for many years uh, for pain management. And then also and then the phytocannabinoids, the stuff you can grow, and also how well you can grow it and uh, the purity of the substance. So the people in California and now the people in Denver have the right idea in legalizing uh, tetrahydrocannabinol or substances or, or cannabis to treat certain syndrome, but certainly has to be moderated because the use of cannabinoids can cause a lot of side effects, okay, because it has a central and a peripheral effect on the nervous system, as I mentioned by those the, the, the cannabinoid receptors, but and the, and the non-inflammatory, non-receptor uh, effect, but also the cannabis causes complications, okay, it has side effects. It can cause uh, psychomotor cognitive impairment. It can cause anxiety and panic attacks, acute psychosis and paranoia. And then, of course, xerostomia, which is a fancy word for saying dry mouth, blurred vision, palpitations, tachycardia, and postural hypotension. Uh, and so, therefore, these are some of the side effects. The other thing we know is the fact that it, we have been able to do some research with uh, tetrahydrocannabinoids. The Germans have done some excellent work in this particular area and have provided us with really some excellent drugs. The whole, the whole challenge with tetrahydrocannabinoids is you have to use a lot of it, okay? Uh, and maybe uh, uh, in, in the future we can have a clinical trial where we actually will test the tetrahydrocannabinol in the different types of pain syndromes. But you would have to use, like I mentioned, quite a bit of it. This dates me, but if you've ever seen the movie Cheech and Chong, Up in Smoke, that's literally how much you need. And so, therefore, it's a lot of tetrahydrocannabinol that we would have to use to be able to take care of pain syndromes. But there are other drugs very much like uh, the, the cannabis that, can also, that are non-opiates that can help with pain management. An example of that are local anesthetics. 
And here, a combination of bupropion and lidocaine are one excellent drugs. These local anesthetics bind with intracellular portions of the sodium channels and block sodium influx, and as well as also calcium influx, into the nerve to prevent depolarization. We also have anti-inflammatory drugs that work through the, the cyclogenase uh, 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 pathway, and, uh, and so that, that also helps in relieving pain through prostaglandins. So different uh, types of anti-inflammatory drugs uh, have, have helped a lot. The one we use very often is ketoprofen, but in combination with certain other drugs can also help. We have drugs that actually help with muscle spasm that are non-opiates, okay? Psychobenzaprine and, and baclofen are drugs that are excellent examples because baclofen is a drug we've used in spinal cord injuries for spasm, okay? But it also has a potential for helping with neuropathic pain, and this, uh, this is activated by the GABA receptors. However, it has a very low affinity for certain types of receptors, the, the gamma hydro the hydrobutyric uh, receptor, and so therefore it has a very, very low tendency to cause addiction, and it has been used in patients for alcoholism and also for autism. Then you have your alpha-2 a adrenergic receptors. Most commonly, the drug we talk about here is uh, clonidine, and certainly it can be used topically in 0.2%. And so these are responsible for the uh, anesthetic and sympatholytic type of action uh, of, of this particular drug, and usually treated transdermally. Uh, we can use, put a sometimes uh, I've used this in the past using a transdermal patch to help with end-of-life type of anxiety and delirium and pain. This is a common drug that's also always included by anesthesiologists who put pain pumps as part of their pain regimen. Yeah, and, of course, you don't have the side effects of sedation, anxiety, and respiratory depression. Then you have the tricyclics. The tricyclics came very early on in pain management to help some very difficult syndromes that we saw, specifically when we saw people with, uh, with post-herpetic neuralgia and people with trigeminal neuralgia where we used amitriptyline. Amitriptyline was the first drug we used and, and it worked very, very well. Unfortunately, it does have a lot of side effects because it's an anticholinergic effect that they would get. So dry mouth and blurred vision were the major things. But its action is really increasing the pools of serotonin and norepinephrine and allowing this neuroconduction and improving the sources of those, these very important neurosubstances to improve contact and, and effect. Uh, anticonvulsants, you know, like, oh my God, you know, this is very common. Uh, let me just make an example of the antidepressants is the fact that sometimes people will go for their prescription fill because they have neuropathic pain, they have post neuralgia, and then the pharmacist says, oh, you're depressed. Well, we're not using it for depression. It can be used for depression, but sometimes pain does cause depression, so subsequently there's a duality in the, the effect of that particular drug. Anticonvulsants are the very much the same way. Okay, they blockade the, the, the uh, voltage-dependent gated uh, sodium and potassium channels, and therefore they, uh, they really help in increasing the amino, amino, uh, butyric, gamma amino butyric acid activity at some subtypes of receptors. So what, what it does is really, as an antagonist, it really helps in relieving those types of pain and uh, those drugs, gabapentin uh, 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 and other drugs like that, help in relieving that pain, including dilantin as well. And, uh, so those type of medications work very, very well. They also have an effect on what we call the AMPA receptors, which is, has a very long name of alpha amino hydroxy 5 methyl iso azo propionic acid receptor, also known as AMPA receptor, and also AMPARs, which are part of these receptor systems. And it's a very complex uh, type of system, as I show you here, of how drugs work, how they affect certain receptors, and how they help relieve pain. So this is part of the neurobiology and also the neuroplasticity associated with pain management. Other types of non-opiates in the methyl the aspartate ion complex inhibitors, ketamine and nemantidine, as well as nemanda, also work on these particular type of receptors. And once again, uh, they increase the dopaminergic and noradrenergic effect of the drugs. Sometimes they also have a blockade of monoamine oxidase inhibitors and also uh, other types of uh, receptors. Uh, calcium channel blockers can be used for pain. This can be used for ischemic pain, deltaizem, verapamil, nifedipine. These calcium channel blockers are class 4 antiarrhythmics. But what they really do is they really they block also the voltage-dependent calcium channels and it's moved muscles, and therefore they cause vasodilatation, so you have ischemic pain. And ischemic pain, uh, especially in patients with severe peripheral arterial disease, 
uh, peripheral vascular disease, and they have the severe ischemic pain because of chronic pain, uh, chronic smoking, uh, uh, arteriosclerosis, and atherosclerosis. So the pain is pretty severe, and this becomes part of the regimen, also in a very topical form and different uh, percentages that help relieve that type of pain. There are drugs sometimes that are used in combination, an opiate agonist and antagonist. The most potent antagonist that we know of in medicine is, is Narcan, okay? And Narcan is a, is a type of uh, inhibitor type of antagonist that blocks the action of the mu receptor drugs. So what it does, and these are examples of antagonists, these type of drugs, Stadol, Nubian, and Talwin, have a tendency to have, cause a blockade in this particular receptor. And they literally, I mean, for example, if a patient is on a particular mu receptor drug, uh, like morphine, and, or have a fentanyl patch, and subsequently they go to the emergency room, and somebody gives them uh, butomorphinone or nalpufine or any type of these, or pentazosine, these type of drugs, then they have the tendency then to, uh, to block that particular mu receptor and precipitate pain. Uh, there are some products that are being used the combination of opiate agonist antagonist and so the combination of an agonist and a antagonist like naloxone like narcan therefore the patient uh, can uh, decrease some of the symptoms uh, very, it's very common for people initially when they're put on a mu receptor drug like morphine or fentanyl or oxycodone or even hydromorphone, uh, they have a tendency to develop a rash. And this is a transitory rash secondary to histamine release from certain mast cells. So subsequently, they, they develop this rash. And some of these uh, studies here show that a combining a, a opiate agonist with an opiate antagonist will improve in decreasing some of the symptoms. The classic drug that we know that we used in substance abuse uh, treatment is Suboxone. So it's very important for us to develop pain assessment tools. You would never change your therapy with insulin without taking, doing a blood sugar. You should never change your pain management without getting a touchstone for what is their visual analog scale. Where is their pain? How is their pain being described? Is it a different type of pain that they initially had? And so subsequently, visual analog scales and pain ratings give us an idea as to where the pain is what makes it better and what makes it worse. So descriptive scales, Wong Baker faces, numeric scales, and pain thermometers used in the elderly will help us to give, differentiate where we are and where do we need to titrate their pain management. Uh, Brian Ginsberg developed excellent tool, one word to describe the intensity of the pain, the location of the pain, and the duration, which is used by the Joint Commission for describing what, the, what are the aggravating factors of alleviating or, or uh, actually causing increase of pain. And we have then also nonspecific behavioral observations, suggesting pain. What if a patient has severe dementia? Can they tell you the type of pain? Can they rate their pain? They can't even speak. They may have aphasia, apraxia, agnosia, and subsequently they're, they're not able to tell you what their pain is. So we look at these nonverbal behaviors like restlessness, guarding, rubbing, fidgety, striking out, okay, and recurrent re agitation. We look at vocalization, crying, moaning, grinding of teeth, labored breathing. All of those are very important. Facial expressions, grimacing, frowning, fearful faces. So the way I manage this particular type of syndrome for people that are having non-specific behaviors of pain is if they have, uh, uh, say, nonverbal behaviors of restlessness and guarding and, and rubbing, two of these and Two of the vocalization, moaning, groaning, labored breathing, or frowning, grimacing, fearful faces, they get three points for each one of them. So then their pain rating is a 9 over 10. When you, when you look at it from a visual analgesic scale or a visual analog scale perspective. There are other things that may cause pain that you can see in their behavior, decreased in activities of daily living, functioning, decrease in appetite, not sleeping well, and resisting range of motion. How do we treat pain? Well, we look at pain and look at the, most of us, when we have pain, we take non-opioid, non-steroidal, some type of medication. We may take aspirin, we may take Tylenol. Sometimes we take non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. But for severe pain, we need to make sure that we use certain type of drugs, opioids and non-opioids, 
that help relieve the pain. The opiate antagonists, not drugs that we mentioned before, the morphine, the meperidine, which is certainly not a drug of choice for chronic pain management, hydromorphone, fentanyl, uh, and uh, oxymorphone, oxycodone, tramadol, and codeine. Uh, codeine is not very used very much anymore, but can be still is available in Tylenol number two or two or three or four. Uh, and then also uh, opiate agonist antagonist, which we talked about is pentazozine and some of their the other type of analogs that help in relieving this type of pain. The big thing here is you never mix opiate agonist and opiate agonist antagonist, okay? Uh, the opiate agonists work usually in the mu receptor, but the opioid agonist antagonists work in the kappa receptor, but they also block the mu receptor. So you have to be careful. You never mix these two together. You never give Talwin with morphine, okay, for an example. And then you have these co-analgesics, as Michael Levy called it in his article in the New England Journal of Medicine. He talked about the adjuvant uh, type of analgesics, and there are various. We talked about them already. The anticonvulsants and how they work. The antidepressants, how they work. And, of course, steroids, also high dose steroids, can actually help with severe lancinating type of pain. You look at baclofen, which is a drug we use for spinal cord injury for severe spasms. And, incidentally, tetrahydrocannabinol also helps for severe uh, muscle spasms and spasms. Uh, eutectic mixtures of local anesthetics. Now we have lidoderm that works very, very well. And in certain situations, even IV lidocaine for severe lancinating neuropathic pain works very well in alleviating that type of pain. Dextromethorphan, bisphosphonates for severe bone pain also helps. Then we have medications for fibromyalgia. It's a very complex syndrome that we see with patients with severe pain. Uh, and so we have a variety of different drugs, like pregabalin, uh, the loxetine, and also milnapram. It's a new drug, Savala, that's used also for uh, fibromyalgia. Um, it is important for us to titrate medications very, very carefully. By that I mean is the fact that we start on low doses and gradually increase the, incrementally the dose to, to achieve a therapeutic effect. So we start with mild, moderate, and severe pain. It has always impressed me sometimes when I see patients and I ask them, well, how is your pain? Describe your pain. Describe other symptoms associated with your pain. What makes your pain worse? What makes your pain better? And go through the litany of questions to making sure they have a good assessment of the pain. Then I say, well, how would you rate your pain? Tell me, well, Dr. Peralta, my pain today, my pain two weeks ago was 8.25. Oh, really? Okay. And what is it today? Well, two weeks after we started this particular regimen, my pain is 6.32. I'm not quite sure how people can be so exacting as far as a numerical to a decimal point how their pain is. But when I assess pain, it's mild, moderate, or severe, and we can use different numbers, mild being 1 to 3, moderate being 4 to 7, and severe being 8 to 10. There's also the syndrome of spasmodic or spastic pain or episodic pain that occurs. And that can occur sometimes with end of dose failure. The medication due to the pharmacodynamics of the drug did not last long enough. And subsequently, you don't get the desired effect. You don't give it more often. You just increase what you're giving every, every eight or every 12 hours. You have incident pain. And sometimes incident pain can occur with movement and activity. We see this very commonly in patients with rheumatoid arthritis or bone mats. The hardest thing that they have to do is get up in the morning. They have severe, severe pain, morning pain. So there's no law. If you're giving medication, you say, well, we're going to give them some morphine, for example, and we're going to give them 30 milligrams or 60 milligrams twice a day. Well, if they're having more pain in the morning, you give them 90 milligrams in the morning and 30 milligrams at night. Okay? There's no law that you have to split it exactly in half. Okay? You can give more when they're more symptomatic and they're having more this type of incident pain. And then breakthrough pain is a crescendo, decrescendo, escalating pain in a, in a type of pain that's already well controlled. It comes out of nowhere all of a sudden. So you have to make sure that you provide breakthrough doses along with your sustained release medication for this type of breakthrough pain. Opiates work very, very quickly, and morphine is the prototype for all, for all type of opiates. So therefore, it has a very short half-life. So within four or five half-lives, you get to a therapeutic level. And that's what I mean about a therapeutic level. You get to what we call a certain log dose of the medication reaching the concentration in the bloodstream. And the concentration in the bloodstream is also the concentration at the receptor. Okay? 
and uh, that's this first order kinetics. So subsequently, it's very important to know that you have a concentration in the blood, but also that concentration also is in that receptor to relieve pain. We call that linear pharmacokinetics. There's the nonlinear pharmacokinetics in which the concentration in the drug is not the concentration in the receptor. And so it's very, very important to know that with opiates, you're going to get a concentration in the bloodstream and in the receptor within a very short period of time. And that just allows you to be able to titrate the medication very, very quickly. So you're able to go from 30 milligrams twice a day. In two days, you can go to 60 milligrams twice a day. And in two days, you can go to 120 milligrams twice a day to really manage that patient's pain very, very well. Uh, there's a way of converting different opiates, and I just leave that table for you, but it's not uncommon. A patient is in the ER or a patient's in the hospital for several days, and they're on IV morphine, and they're taking, say, say for example, 60 milligrams of IV morphine for 24 hours. So their oral dose would be three times that. So that would be 180 milligrams of morphine that they would need daily. And that's a very common mistake that people do. Is they don't do the correct equal allergies of conversion necessary for that. The same thing works for uh, transdermal fentanyl or opiates. I had the privilege of working in a worldwide study uh, with uh, Janssen Pharmaceutical many years ago as a safety study to develop the 12, point, the 12 microgram uh, per hour patch as well as a safety study to allow kids to be able to be administered the duragesic patch at that time. Uh, or, but now we now have generic type of uh, trans, uh, transdermal fentanyl. The biggest thing here is to understand that this is a drug delivery system, okay, that allows you to put a concentration as uh, transdermally and the concentration is absorbed continuously through the capillaries and then it's stored in fats and then you develop a diffusion gradient in which you get a certain steady state of medication every hour. So when you describe whether it's a duergesic patch or a generic fentanyl patch, it's describing it as 25 or 12 micrograms per hour. That's how much you're getting, 50, 100, and so forth. So when you look at uh, a patch of 100 micrograms per hour over a 24-hour period of time, it's delivering approximately 2,400 micrograms of fentanyl per hour, which is equivalent then to approximately uh, 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 for patients like, uh, like this, uh, based on its, uh, its conversion dose of 1 to 100 or 1 to 10, they're getting approximately uh, 200 milligrams of morphine per 24 hours. So that's a good conversion and a good idea to have. The use of opiates sometimes is a big concern with how is it that opiates affect not only pain, but also dyspnea. So opiates work in affecting dyspnea by cerebral sedation. They relax the patient. They have a vagal stimulation effect, specifically uh, morphine, that actually will vasodilate the vessels. Uh, it has an analgesic effect. It has an effect on the airways and the J receptors. And then it has a, a very, very sensitive effect on the carbon dioxide receptors in the medulla. What it really does, it decreases input into these carbon dioxide receptors. Okay, So it attenuates those receptors so that a person can tolerate a, a hypercapnia, higher carbon dioxide, and a hypoxemia, lower oxygenation, without setting off the normal ventilatory alarms. So they're not breathing 80 times a minute, they're breathing 20 times a minute. And this is how opiates work with dyspnea. There are opiate-induced neurotoxicities. And uh, as you see on the slide, uh, the nausea, vomiting, puritis, uh, euphoria, constipation, cerebral sedation, and more importantly, uh, the psychomimetic type of effects or the psychomimetic phenomenon. And here, you people have uh, a variety of confusion, delirium, uh, auditory and visual hallucinations, and psychosis that's associated with that. They also have what's very commonly called uh, tactile hallucinations, where they will pick uh, uh, objects or ants or spiders or something off the, their, their clothing or off of the sheets or off themselves or off other people. And that's one of the side effects that we see from opiates, especially mu receptor drugs, because they have this particular side effect of tactile hallucinations. Uh, additionally, they can cause uh, myoclonal jerking. And what we try to do in agitation and delirium is uh, what we talk as uh, opiate rotation. So what we try to do with this opiate-induced type of neurotoxicities is to, to switch to another drug or to rotate to another non-opiate uh, medication to see if, therefore, we can address some of those issues. Sometimes when they have a lot of sedation, we can use certain type of neurostimulants, uh, so methylphenidate uh, and also uh, other drugs that uh, help with uh, 
with sleepiness uh, uh, are also very helpful. Provigil is one of them also that we use in palliative medicine to treat this opiate-induced sedation. When it comes to taking care of patients that are acutely ill and have potentially a life-limiting or life-threatening or life-altering type of disease, we look at patients that we know that you need to know it's very, very dynamic, okay? Not because of the disease, you know the end point of the disease, but because the symptoms they may have are very dynamic. So we need to change and be aware of how to do adequate symptom management, specifically pain management, to address those particular symptoms for them. So and there are barriers to pain management, okay? Patient barriers and caregiver barriers and professional barriers, okay? Uh, adverse uh, drug effects, we look about fear of addiction, which we'll speak about later on, lack of knowledge, pain as a symptom. Is this really a sentinel marker? Is my disease getting worse? Is it getting better? What does the pain mean in my disease process? Knowledge deficit and also the fact of fear of addiction. Other barriers have to do with our just natural reluctance to discuss end-of-life issues with patients, especially those related with pain. The paucity of clinical education and training in pain management and symptom management, and then limited exposure and knowledge of healthcare professionals on the signs and symptoms that we see with a variety of uh, uh, diseases when they're close to death. This is a major paradigm shift for many physicians going from cure, trying to cure and prolong life to providing very good comfort care through palliative measures. So there's misconceptions of the elderly. You know, as we become part of what I call the mature elite, I'm not old, I'm not a geriatric patient, I'm not a baby boomer, and certainly I'm not a senior. What I am is I'm part of the mature elite. So these mature elite people, and the misconceptions of these mature elite people, or elderly people, is the fact that they say, well, chronic pain is part of aging. Pain should never occur, no matter what age you are. Does it herald serious disease? At times it can. It's certainly not a punishment for past actions. And acknowledging pain is important because of the fact that some people are afraid of invasive procedures or certain types of medications that they're taking. Cognitively impaired people have higher thresholds of pain and cannot be assessed for pain. I will tell you, for the last uh, probably 15 years of caring for patients with different types of neurogenitive disorders, whether it be Alzheimer's, supranuclear palsy, or, uh, dementia of Lewy bodies, or frontal temporal dementias, or, or other types of diseases like Parkinsonism, uh, we look at how we can treat patients. They can't really explain to you the pain that they have, but their cognitive impairment doesn't change the severity of the pain. And the pain has the full dimension, as Dane Sissoli Sander taught us, both physical, psychological, social, and spiritual pain. So it's important for us, as part of treatment alternatives, to know the discussion with that. You know, oh, you're going to get pain, oh, she's going to get morphine, oh, you're going to euthanize the patient. No, none of that's going to happen. Because all of us learned uh, disease process and symptom management under a primary worldview, which is a technical review of treating diseases. On alternative approaches and a more spiritual aspect of this, from a more of an Eastern worldview, is what happens to people and how we manage their disease. So there's a lot of modalities that we can use, and we'll discuss them in the third part, regarding managing pain as well. Now, there's a lot of confusion about this, because when we use certain medications, when we do certain procedures, there's confusion about what we're doing. When somebody brings up the word euthanasia, I go, oh, no, I'm against euthanasia. No, no, it depends on what type of euthanasia you're talking about. Euthanasia, passive euthanasia, and indirect euthanasia was defined to us by the Supreme Court. And so passive euthanasia is the withdrawing, withholding, and terminating of certain life-sustaining substances uh, and certain procedures and certain, uh, certain types of, uh, and allowing the patient to die a very natural death. Indirect euthanasia is the administration of certain types of medications to make the patient person comfortable. And these palliative measures will generally lead to a comfortable, peaceful, dignified death in the setting of their choice. There are two states that allow physicians to suicide, both in Oregon, Oregon Death with Dignity Act, and also in Washington. And there are two countries that allow active euthanasia, and that's what Dr. Kevorkian did, okay, in Detroit. And so that is actually literally providing the means for the patient, that is uh, applying certain uh, products, giving certain products, or doing certain instrumentation to cause the death of the patient. And then he did it through carbon monoxide in his van. But or lethal injection. So those are the differentiations. The active euthanasia occurs in uh, Denmark and in Belgium. So we have an ethical responsibility. We have an ethical imperative to make sure that we manage pain appropriately. And how we protect ourselves is the definition or this principle of double effect. 
what was our intent in doing this particular procedure or providing this particular medication for the patient. Our intent was to provide comfort and to relieve suffering. Our intent was, in a very, very complex way, to address their issue with pain in certain mu receptors, kappa receptors, delta receptors, and methyl d aspartate ion complex receptors to relieve the pain for the patient and allow them to have a quality of life, which is very, very important. We look at this as uh, if we don't add, do adequate pain management, and I see a lot of this happening nowadays, there's a strong prima facie for patients wanting to have be free of pain. If there's one thing they want, you know, is to be free of pain. Pain can be dehumiliating. It can be pain also can actually dehumanize patients. And as Eric Sell mentioned, pain can destroy the soul itself. Have you seen patients with severe pain? I can tell you that it can actually hurt, hurt patients. Precepts for pain management. Now we have excellent information. Now we have the basic science. Now we have the clinical science. And now we have the clinical application of that science addressing symptoms of pain. There's no excuse for not providing adequate pain management. We know that 70% of patients with advanced cancer have moderate to severe pain. We know that the agency in healthcare policy and research provide a treatment for cancer pain and also for chronic non-malignant pain. We know the basic science as we discussed today is how a pain occurs. Picant pain because of its neurotoxicity causes death of the, uh, the inhibitory interneuron and that promulgates this positive feedback system and pain then becomes intolerable and it changes the whole psyche of the person. Joint commission standards of pain. Pain as the fifth vital sign for us to manage. So it's important to apply certain general principles of pain. These are excellent principles by AMDA that were developed for patients with nursing in the nursing home by the medical directors, but they apply in all settings. Administer medications routinely and on PRN because you would never give a blood pressure medication as needed because you wouldn't control the blood pressure. If you want to control the pain, they have to be given on a routine basis, and you titrate that dose based on their visual analog scale. You do the least invasive way, which, least invasive way, which is usually oral or, or rectal or transdermal, uh, and then eventually, if you do you need to, you can use parental. Uh, begin at low dose and titrate very slowly, serially, monitoring the patient every two or three days to make sure that you're going in the right direction as far as the visual analog scale, and reassessing and adjusting the dose continuously to optimize the relief of that particular pain. I'll, I'll close with a very short story about this pain. Uh, I was making rounds uh, in one of the major hospitals. And um, uh, a young man, a 28-year-old young man, rolled up to me and said, uh, oh, they tell me you're the pain doctor. And I said, yes, sir, I am. I, I do pain management. How can I help you? And he said, well, I'm a veteran. I could tell that. He, he was a veteran, 28-year-old veteran from the Iraq War. And he said, uh, and I lost my legs. I said, yes, sir. So I said, and my feet are on fire. And you look down, he didn't have any toes, he didn't have any feet, he didn't have any legs. He was above a knee amputation. And so I said, well, tell me about your pain. So he described his pain to me as a burning, shooting, shock like pain. He told me about the fact that he couldn't sleep at night, that it made him angry, that it was not actually the loss of limbs that had caused the loneliness and the despair that he had, but the pain that was just kind of almost driving him mad. And then he asked me at the very end, can you do something about it? And I was walking with a group of other colleagues, and I said, John, you have chronic pain, and you're going to have pain the rest of your life. And everybody kind of just shirked away, and they, they said, oh, my God, you shouldn't have said that to him. And then he was in a wheelchair, and then he just grabbed me from the neck and pulled me up so we were nose to nose. And he looked at me, and I saw tears in his eyes. And he said, Dr. Peralta, you're the first doctor that has ever told me the truth. And he let me go, and I stood up, and I said, you know, the reason I said that, John, is because of the neurobiology of pain management, the things we just talked about, okay, is that I know that he's had pain for the last four or five years, and the best we can do in chronic pain is, to, is really to reduce it by 50%. By 50%. That's the best we can do. So if it's a 10, it was, he was telling me it was a 10, the best we can do is to do it as a 5. But you have to follow my regimen. You have to do what I tell you. You can't break from that regimen. You have to make sure you take the drugs just the way I described them. And we'll talk about that in, a, in a part 3, which is very, very important. And uh, 
He said, I'll do anything you ask me to do. Okay. And I explained to him that because he has had a neurobiological change in his body, his neural circuitry and has changed, that this is the reason he had severe pain. And it's going to be difficult. But he said, Doctor, I will take a five. Because that to me is improvement, and that to me improves the quality of my life. So we worked toward that goal for him. Thank you very much for allowing us once again to come to your, to your uh, living room, come to your uh, uh, classroom and provide this presentation, and we'll continue with the third part after a short break. Uh, any questions you may have, uh, please uh, move them forward or uh, call them out.